You're listening to Policy Currents, a weekly podcast from the RAND Corporation. I'm Deanna Lee. And I'm Evan Banks. Every Friday, we bring you new insights from RAND's latest research and commentary. It's March 31st. This week's mass shooting in Nashville is the latest awful reminder of the scourge of gun violence in America and the need to keep schools safe. Before opening fire at the Covenant School, the shooter reportedly sent a chilling Instagram message to a friend that said, I am planning to die today. The shooter had also shared past suicidal thoughts with others. While the friend did contact the authorities, the shooting began just minutes after the report was made. Speaking up about a potential threat fell short of preventing the attack in Nashville on Monday. But the possibility that, with a bit more time, the situation might have been averted underscores just how vital threat reporting is to preventing school violence. Threat reporting is the focus of a recent RAND study. The authors find that, too often, concerns about potential violence aren't brought to light until after violence occurs. In fact, one of the most consistent findings in the research on school shootings is that someone knew an attack was possible and didn't report it. The study looked at ways to address this, examining what states, districts, and schools can do to encourage people, especially students, to report potential threats. Lead author Pauline Moore says she and her colleagues heard the same thing from almost everyone they talked to. If kids feel supported, if they have someone they can trust, they'll come forward. In other words, building a trusting school climate is key. Students who feel a strong connection to their school, a sense of belonging, are much more likely to report a threat and believe their concerns will be taken seriously. The researchers also recommend establishing tip lines and emphasize the need for training. Our study reveals that students often don't realize the importance of the information they have, or they may wave off threats as a joke or they don't want to get their friends in trouble. Training events can help students know what to report and how to report it. It goes back to the need to make students more comfortable, Moore said, quote, to the notion that building a positive and inclusive environment is the main thing that has to happen to encourage reporting. Neurodivergent is an umbrella term that covers a variety of cognitive diagnoses, such as autism spectrum disorder, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, dyslexia, and Tourette's syndrome. A new RAND study looks at the benefits that individuals with neurodivergence bring to the national security workforce. The findings reveal that neurodivergent people have many skills that fit the needs of national security job descriptions, from excellent problem-solving skills and pattern recognition capabilities to attention to detail and memory skills. And because of this, a neurodiverse workforce can strengthen a national security organization. Despite the benefits, the study also finds that there are barriers to hiring and retaining neurodivergent workers in national security organizations. For example, aspects of the recruitment and hiring process can get in the way of promoting a neurodiverse workforce. These include unclear or confusing job descriptions, complex application processes, and job interviews that focus more on social and behavioral norms than on the actual technical knowledge and skills required for a position. And once neurodivergent employees are hired, they can face challenges navigating workplaces that are not designed with them in mind. These challenges include sensory overload, rigid and tightly packed time schedules, unspoken social norms, and lack of clarity in instructions. It's worth pointing out that there are, of course, neurodivergent individuals who are already part of the national security workforce. However, the size of the neurodivergent population is not known, as many of these individuals do not openly acknowledge their neurodivergence for fear of discrimination and bias. The authors of this report go on to recommend four keys to embracing neurodiversity across the national security enterprise. First, provide all employees with accommodations that mitigate the effects of sensory stimulation. 
These accommodations might include the ability to choose a desk location or to change or remove light bulbs to reduce brightness or providing access to noise-canceling headphones. Second, modify job vacancies and hiring practices to attract neurodivergent candidates. Changes to hiring practices could include using concrete, jargon-free language in job descriptions and updating the interview process. Third, help all employees understand neurodiversity. Opportunities to build understanding include inviting experts to present on the topic of neurodiversity and requiring training for managers. Fourth, and finally, support systemic change across the organization. This might include incorporating neurodivergent people into major policy decisions, making changes to the security clearance process, and examining military recruitment processes that can exclude qualified candidates. The recent kidnapping and murder of U.S. citizens by members of the Gulf Cartel in Mexico has spurred public outrage and congressional action. Legislators have introduced a bill to formally designate several drug cartels as foreign terrorist organizations. What might be the effects of making such a designation? RAND's Brian Michael Jenkins explains that the foreign terrorist label is seen to offer several advantages. To start, it facilitates the prosecution of individuals who might provide material support to such groups. Designation as a terrorist group also enables the U.S. Treasury Department to outlaw financial transactions and freeze assets. And it allows authorities to bar entry into the U.S. and facilitates the removal of non-U.S. citizens. But in the case of these cartels, Jenkins notes that it's not clear whether or how exactly adding a terrorist label would significantly expand U.S. legal authority. After all, a cartel's primary activity, drug trafficking, is already a serious crime in the U.S., and there are ample statutes to deal with it. What the terrorist label may do, however, is elevate the problem, suggesting that more must be done to address it. In this instance, it might suggest that if Mexico doesn't do something, then the U.S. will. In other words, it sends a loud message. When it comes down to it, Jenkins says that labeling cartels foreign terrorist groups likely won't address the core issue. Quote, America's problem with drug trafficking is not the lack of statutes, but the magnitude of the problem. Requiring low-performing students to repeat a grade, also called grade retention, has been a highly debated intervention in the U.S. for decades. And it's no surprise that it's been a common proposal to help get kids back on track in the wake of the pandemic. But what does research say about this practice? When RAND experts took a look at the evidence, they found that grade retention in middle or high school typically leads to worse educational outcomes, with little or no effect on academic achievement and higher levels of student disengagement. It's a different story for elementary school students. It appears that grade retention in elementary school may, in fact, be a cost-effective way to help students make up for missed learning. But this takeaway comes with some caveats. First, almost all early grade retention policies that yield positive results contain instructional supports for students who repeat a grade, such as summer learning programs or tailored academic improvement plans. Second, it's important to objectively identify the students who are the most likely to benefit from retention. This means applying the same grade retention criteria across the board and not exempting some students based on, say, their standardized test scores. Third, relatively little is known about the long-term effects of grade retention. For instance, there's no evidence that early grade retention results in higher rates of graduation or college enrollment. According to our researchers, school and district leaders would do well to keep these points in mind when considering grade retention policies as a way to make up for pandemic-related learning loss. Before we end today's episode, we'd like to note that on Wednesday, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration approved over-the-counter sales of Narcan, a nasal spray version of naloxone, a drug that can reverse the effects of an opioid overdose. You may remember that we recently discussed a sweeping new RAND report on opioids in America. In that report, 
the authors included increased access to naloxone, as well as trainings on how to administer this life-saving drug, as one of dozens of policy ideas that could help tackle this complex problem. You can find the full report and all of our recommendations at rand.org slash opioid ecosystem. That's it for today's episode. You can learn more about the topics we discussed in the show notes at rand.org slash podcast. We'll see you next week. RAND is a nonprofit institution that helps improve policy and decision-making through research and analysis.